In the wake of last week's dive into winter's hottest garbage, some people were wondering where the heck Mushoku Tensei got to. How is Mushoku Tensei not topping this list? Mushoku Tensei should be on this list. I said what I said. Good thing today is also a new episode of Mushoku Tensei, a palate cleanser to all this tra- Wait, that one was positive. A lot of the comments mentioning Mushoku Tensei or Jobless Reincarnation are positive, actually, and the ones that aren't only have a few likes each. But I'm gonna make a clickable mountain out of that molehill of politely worded, understandably apprehensive social media comments, pretend like this entire art form and community is under large-scale siege because some people said they don't like a thing I like, specifically due to its intentionally transgressive, upsetting content, and preemptively nuke them from orbit by saying, Mushoku Tensei is art, you Philistines. I wish I didn't have to spoil the mock outrage gag right away by saying this, but angry tweet reading YouTube being what it is these days, please don't actually get mad at or attack people for publicly not liking Mushoku Tensei or any other anime for that matter. It's a perfectly reasonable position for a person to hold. This is a heckin' weird anime whose source material is the progenitor of a lot of heckin' weird anime cliches that mostly appear in trash and are broadly seen as indicators of trash. And, regardless of his future growth, its protagonist is only very technically not a pedophile anymore for now. People judge books by their covers. That's why books have covers. It's not worth getting mad about. That said, Mushoku Tensei is not trash, and I hope anybody watching who thinks it is will at least hear me out on that point with an open mind. I'm not saying you have to like it, or even not hate it. It definitely contains plenty of hateable content. Anyone going into the series should know that it deals with sexual assault, pedophilia, slavery, and a lot of other dark shit, and not always in tasteful ways, but always in an honest, unflinching way, and never without considered artistic purpose. Not unlike how Maiden Abyss approaches its unsettling, lurid elements. And that's at least worthy of respectful consideration. The same goes for the trashy tropes that Jobless Reincarnation helped to cement. But before we get into that, this video is sponsored by Raycon, who are disrupting the electronics industry by designing premium wireless audio for half the price with zero compromises. High fidelity sound, hefty bass, discreet aesthetic designs in a range of fun colors and patterns, and a customizable noise isolating fit so comfy you'll forget you're even wearing them. I know I do. I bought my own pair of Performance E55s back in September, long before they reached out to me, and I've been using them daily ever since. They make it a joy to listen to my favorite gaming soundtracks while cleaning the house, walking to the store, or writing these very videos, and with that comfy, discreet fit and six hours of playtime, Raycons are perfect for falling asleep to ebooks, multi hour video essays, and or dubbed anime. Thanks to Raycons, being alone with my thoughts is a thing of the past. Plus, their 36-hour battery life and seamless Bluetooth pairing mean they always just work when I need them to. They're hands down the best earbuds I've ever owned and considerably cheaper than anything else that offers comparable quality or comfort. There's a reason so many music pros like Spyro the Dragon's Uncle Snoop Dogg are obsessed with their Raycons, but you don't have to take my or their word for it because Raycon offers a 45-day free return policy to let you see for yourself which of their great products is the right fit for you. Click the link in the doobly-doo or go to buyraycon.com slash mother's basement to get 15% off your Raycon purchase and help support my channel in the process. One more time, that's buyraycon.com slash mother's basement. By this point, I can't even count how many anime I've seen about nerds dying used up and lonely and then getting to relive their childhoods in fantasy worlds reminiscent of popular video games, eventually saving those worlds with fabulous secret powers, and picking up one or more beautiful fantasy brides in the bargain. And for obvious reason, there is a huge market hungry for that flavor of escapist wish fulfillment. But back in 2012, when Mushoku Tensei first hit web novel hub Shosetsuka Ninaro alongside Konosuba, ReZero, Overlord, and Isekai Isekaya, the size and voracity of that market was largely unknown. While 
just about every light novel and anime that's followed in their footsteps has simply stuck to formula in cynical pursuit of easy clout and cash, hence why they're all trash, those early authors were simply taking ideas set forth in the then newly popular SAO and running with them in whatever direction their imagination wanted to go. Mushoku Tensei is written the way it is and contains the characters, tropes, and scenarios that it does solely because its author, Rifujin Namagonote, thought those things would make for an interesting story. The series doesn't just let an otaku neat play hero and feel up waifus as a cosmic consolation prize for his sad life, it explores in great depth the major character flaws at the root of that sadness and asks why, of all the people in the multiverse, a fantasy world in need might summon up such a sad sack loser as its savior, and what it would take for such a pitiable creature to actually become a real hero. He's about as far from a projectable blank slate as anime protagonists get, and while he's written to be sympathetic and psychologically fascinating, it is crystal clear from the get-go that we're not supposed to like him or most of the things he does. The man who would be Rudeus Greyrat was an unambiguous piece of shit. The sort of person who, after three decades spent making nothing of himself and mooching off his parents, had the nerve to skip their funeral and hole up in their house with what is heavily implied to be Nobuhiro Watsuki's kind of movie. Understandably, his remaining family kicks him the fuck out after coming home to find that. And right then, when he's being forced into a reckoning with the emptiness of his own existence, he spies a truck barreling through an intersection toward a group of teens, and without hesitation, he trades his life long wasted for theirs still to come. So he's also that sort of person, the kind who would put his life on the line to save a stranger given the chance. Thus, powerful cosmic forces decide to give him another one, and that cavernous contradiction at the heart of his character does everything to define how he takes it. The very first thing we learn about Rudy, the thing that defines him as he takes his first steps into this new world, is that he's a pervert. Not horny, he won't be physiologically capable of that for years to come, but his hikikomori habits have conditioned him to act like he is, because it's the only way he knows to have fun anymore. Thanks to sharp writing and comic timing, his vulgar inner monologue and lecherous behavior are at times about as funny as that stuff gets in anime. How funny that is depends on your taste, but he's also just straight up sad. While his parents, blinded by love, don't yet see Rudeus for what he is, their maid Lilia, who, as we'll learn, has experience being leered at, immediately recognizes the intent behind the supposedly innocent infant's gaze, and it terrifies her, something she's forced to live with, alone, for years. It'll take Rudeus far longer than that to learn anything from it, but from the very beginning, the series is making clear that his uninvited lust is harmful to the women he forces it upon, even when he's just looking. And that might have been all that defined Rudeus, well into an equally sad second adulthood, but for one discovery that galvanized his inner, and at the time, outer, child. There is magic in this world. Eating. Mushoku Tensei's setting is animated with rich historical and natural texture, the likes of which I haven't felt since Spice and Wolf, and its execution of that style is even more exemplary. Beautifully painted backgrounds and lively, delicately inked animations create the impression of a storybook come alive. Consistent, moody lighting gives every scene depth, and a subtle film grain filter ties all those elements together in the composite, helping to disguise background CGI and giving the final image a printed-on-paper quality that many anime have tried and failed to achieve with actual paper filters. There's a lot that other anime productions can learn from this one on a purely technical level, but what's even more important is how all of these elements come together to immerse you in its world, all so that the even more beautiful magic effects can blow you away as much as they do Rudy. From the moment Zenith first lays her healing hands on him, a second obsession is born in the boy, and until Roxy arrives to tutor him, the joy he takes in exploring and discovering that is kept entirely separate from his first one. 
When he's up in the attic playing with water balls, Rudeus is just a kid, messing around and learning with the single-minded determination of youth. Even after he meets Roxy, while he does ogle her during lore lectures, he learns quickly that there are dangers to distracted casting, and generally tones down his antics when the wands are out. When she's taught him his final lesson, and he moves on to teaching Sylphie and later Eris, despite being an absolute creep outside the classroom, he still takes their lessons seriously inside it and avoids doing anything that might disrupt their learning. Magic practically becomes a platonic island in the sea of sex and perversion that is this medieval world, and working hard at it, seeing the women in his life do the same, is the main catalyst that spurs Rudy's growth as a character and his growing respect for them, not as characters, but people. Although, every time he expresses that respect, the show comically contrasts the statement with an action contradicting it. For example, keeping a stolen pair of Master Roxy's panties which is also one more uncomfortable thing that he forces Lilia to deal with. I've heard it argued that this contradicts the notion he's growing as a character. I'd argue that it merely shows how far he has to go. This series takes the long road in every aspect of his development. Like, 25 volumes covering his entire lifespan long, though we're only looking at the animated tip of that iceberg today. Magic doesn't just come isekai easy to Rudeus. He does become an astronomically powerful wizard and master of multiple languages over the course of his hero's journey, but not because those abilities are just arbitrarily handed to him by God. Having an adult mind piloting his child body simply allows him to direct its innately accelerated learning ability and train his still-growing form to do magic in ways that people who start later in life simply cannot. But even then, it's not an exclusive special skill. Silphy, who starts practicing almost as early as Rudeus, quickly picks up the same trick of wordless casting. He has an undeniable advantage over most people starting life in this world, but one directly rooted in the specific mechanics that brought him here and the odd nature of his existence, not just divine coincidence. And he still has to apply himself with intense dedication to achieve what he does. Fueled by some innate interest in the subject matter, nerds do love lore and magic, but mostly by a lifetime of deep-seated, agonizing regret, which also believably hampers his growth. It takes years and a lot of encouragement from his kind, understanding teacher just to work up the courage to leave his house. He draws on that regret in Episode 7, when he has to talk Eris into not giving up on the aspects of her noble womanly studies, specifically dancing, that she's just not good at and doesn't like doing. He's lived that way and knows exactly where it leads, and in his new life has come to appreciate the rewards of hard work, especially at something you're not good at. That scene resonated with me on a deep level, and the subsequent scenes where he helps her nail her birthday dance and then awards both her and her bodyguard slash sword instructor Ghislaine with wands, just like the one Roxy gave him, absolutely warmed my heart. Immediately afterward, he's given an opportunity to ruin all that again when he wakes up in Eris's bed, and for the first time, out of respect for her hard work and understanding of how much she treasures both his and Ghislaine's gifts, Rudeus doesn't take that opportunity. Clearly, he is growing, but while not assaulting girls in their sleep is sadly progress for him, it's not even the bare minimum. He still has to unlearn a lot of bad assumptions about women and sex that he's built up through a lifelong diet of anime porn games. That's not just my interpretation of his character. He explicitly calls himself out for it in the next episode, after what is by far his worst on-screen transgression. Content warning for sexual assault. Gonna try to keep this as clean as I can, but use the chapters or timestamp to skip past it if you don't want to think about it at all. At the behest of her father, Philip, who wants Rudy to marry her and join in a good old-fashioned family coup, Eris agrees to do some naughty stuff with Rudeus in his room, and he immediately charges headfirst out of her overtly defined comfort zone because he's scum. Then he gets his ass very justifiably beat for it. In the lead-up, he doesn't even think of her by name, only getting excited for the chance to get with a tsundere. But in the aftermath, he reflects. What are you doing? 
ヒロインの気持ちが分かった気にでもなっていたか This line draws a direct line from his hurtful objectification of Eris to his past life obsession with fake anime girls. And the lesson he's learning here is one that most anime dealing with sex, even good ones like Horimiya, either gloss over or ignore that consent is fluid and conditional, not a binary state you can just fade to black from. Yes to one thing doesn't mean yes to everything. Respecting that is actually the bare minimum. He got there. Though I don't know if I can defend what it took to get there. This scene made me the most uncomfortable out of any in the show, which is saying a lot. I won't show them here, but some of the shots in it are very explicit. Unlike other anime that integrate fan service into scenes exploring sensitive subject matter, I don't think Mushoku Tensei mixes its message here. Rudius is thinking of Eris like H game CGI, and the subjective camera work definitely reflects that. And the etchy elements are immediately shut down the second he crosses the line. Note that when she spin kicks his stupid asshole face in, there's not a single frame where you can see up her skirt. This being anime, that had to be intentional. Still, I can't blame anyone who just nopes the fuck out of the whole thing the second it starts before seeing where they're going with it. It is hard to recommend watching. I won't say it's the wrong directing choice, but I won't argue with anyone who thinks it is, or anyone who thinks addressing issues of consent like that with characters this young is flat out unacceptable. That said, the show itself does acknowledge that these characters being put in this situation by the adults around them is indicative of a serious societal problem. The men around Rudius all give him a pass for just about everything he does and do. Way worse shit themselves. Because this is a medieval European setting, and that's what Middle Ages European nobility was actually like. Something a lot of other fantasy anime either whitewash or play for cheap fetish indulgence without seriously addressing how fucked up those societies really were. Mushoku Tensei doesn't shy away from showing the psychological impact this culture has on the women living in it, or how it normalizes and encourages reprehensible behavior from men, especially powerful men. Rudius, for all his faults, isn't shy about calling them like he sees them, and he sees most of the men in his life, including his own father, as fundamentally bad people. Paul Notos Grey Rat is a philandering rapist who cheated on his pregnant wife with one of his former victims, jeopardizing Lilia's job and life in the process. Uncle Philip is a power hungry schemer who openly offers to tie his own underage daughter up and plant her in Rudius' bed in exchange for the 10 year old boy's cooperation in a violent coup. Then he sends her in anyway after the boys said no. Both he and Grandpa Soros have a thing for. Beast folk slaves, too. And these are the good guys in the Grey Rat family. The ones ruthless enough to actually hold power at the top are apparently even worse. But that's exactly what makes them interesting as characters. Despite being products of both a bad environment and their own wicked choices, they are capable of doing uncommonly good things. They have good traits that certainly don't outweigh the bad, not even close, but do count for something. Paul is a bad guy, but also a good ish parent who tries to provide his son and later daughters with opportunities and teach them to be better than himself, even if he is kind of a shit teacher. <laughs> I haven't met many dads like Kenichi Natsuki. I've seen a lot like Paul Grey Rat. Most of us have folks like that in our lives who are good to us, but not to most people, and not always, but they try or try to try. I haven't seen much fiction that captures that as well as Mushoku Tensei does. The women in the series tend to tip in the opposite direction from the men, which makes sense given that most of them don't have any power to abuse and are, in fact, the ones being abused. Zenith is both a great mom and a great person, kind and understanding even to people who really don't deserve it, like Paul. She sure can be smug, though. Lilia is quiet, sharp witted, observant, the type to keep things bottled up and let it spill out at inopportune times. 
Roxy is outspoken to a fault, quick to judgment, yet slow to think through the potential consequences of her actions, like firing a water bullet through Zenith's tree. She's also, as Rudius discovers late one night, a bit of a voyeuristic creep herself, which perhaps explains why she's so patient with him. She's also a very good teacher, adept at giving gentle pushes, though she pushes herself hard to learn new things, especially after witnessing Rudy's magical prowess. I really like how they help encourage each other to learn the demon god language by becoming pen pals. It's a slick writing touch that helps to develop both their abilities and their romance. If we're talking about Rudy's study buddies, though, then Eris and Ghislaine are easily my favorite characters in the whole show. The Beast Woman bodyguard was once the very embodiment of, this sign can't stop me, I can't read. But having struggled and been bamboozled due to her illiteracy and lack of math skills, she now values learning more than most. She's still a fighter, first and foremost, though, more dedicated to the sword than literally almost anyone else on the planet, and capable of combat feats that are out and out terrifying, even in comparison to most of the magic we've seen. Her immense strength translates to an easygoing attitude, and she gets along well with both Rudy and Eris, despite both being pretty temperamental. She's got some of the funniest lines and moments in the whole show, but also provides solid emotional support when needed. She's just a great character all around, basically the rock if he was a cat girl. Eris isn't nearly as capable when we first meet her, though she sure acts like she's the greatest thing to ever grace this earth. A lot of that owes to her grandfather, who both spoils her rotten and sets a rotten example with his violent, indiscriminate temper. It takes a lot for her to warm up to Rudeus, and even more for her to let go of her stubborn pride and be taught magic and swordsmanship, but once she accepts it, she learns quickly and grows into what I can only describe as a consummate anime badass. Her sword fighting animations are so good, and I love how they work that into her learning to dance. She and Rudy also have truly great chemistry, pushing each other to learn and improve, especially in the art of the blade. They're almost like shonen rivals, which, as we all know, is the most romantic kind of relationship there is, and the way they develop feelings for each other over the years is surprisingly sweet and natural, despite her father's interference. Eris's mom is also phenomenal. They play her up like this typical evil queen, framing it like she despises Rudeus for petty branch family bullshit or whatever, but then we find out that it's because she's been deeply personally wounded by the Grey Rat clan, who took her own sons away from her because of bullshit succession rules. So, of course she resents this stranger who gets to live with her when her own boys can't. Like, how unfair is that? But then, he cries when the family throws him a birthday party. Instantly, she realizes how lonely he must feel so far from home, just like her sons must feel and she vows to love him like a son. No, marry him off to her daughter. Then she gets carted out of the building by the guards, and it is a top 10 anime gag, but a gag with real, meaningful heart and soul behind it, containing an entire character arc. That is actually genius writing. And it points to what is, I think, the most powerful thing about Mushoku Tensei. At its heart, this is a story about family, finding family, protecting family, failing your family, and forgiving your family. Sometimes even when you probably shouldn't. Family that's not perfect, that hurts you sometimes, but still provides essential comfort and warmth in a cold, harsh world. Family as it too often is, not how we wish it could be. This is a show that looks straight at the ugly side of humanity and finds complicated beauty in and around it. It's also got an incredible butt joke that I can't stop thinking about, centered around a butt that's also incredible, and that I also can't stop thinking about in a totally non-horny way. You open Ghislaine's pants expecting fan service, but what you find is goals. I've spent most of this video delving into this show's serious emotional side, but it is a comedy as much as a drama, and equally vulgar in both respects. And I think I'm in agreement with So I'm a Spider, So What's mangaka Asahiro Kakashi in their recent Twitter praise of how it affirms vulgarity. Link to that in the doobly-doo, it's a good read. 
in the real world right now, kids hear their parents wrestling down the hall all the time. In the place and time this fantasy setting is based on, you absolutely could have just walked in on a big, important lord-type guy abusing a maid. Real children were offered up as political bargaining chips to disgusting men as old as Rudeus actually is. We all know this, Game of Thrones was very popular. And Mushoku Tensei is similar in how it portrays sex as both an intrinsic part of its world and of its narrative as a game played by the powerful, often with dubiously consenting pieces, for pleasure and profit. Of course, that exact argument is often used to make excuses for things that obviously are not gunning for any kind of realism and just want to indulge in vaguely historical debauchery. And I won't tell you it's easy to tell the difference at first or even tenth glance. There's a line between this is the way it is because that's just how the world is and the world is how it is because the author wanted to get away with stuff. It's hard to pin down exactly where that line lies, if it's determined by how much historical research and imaginative detail went into the world building, or how much of the plot isn't obvious indulgence, how it presents the parts that clearly are, maybe the skin-to-fabric ratio of the costume designs factors into it. Regardless, when I watch it, I feel very strongly that Mushoku Tensei is on one side of that line and most isekai that do similar things are on the other. It definitely toes the line, and I have no doubt that some of the author's personal preferences influenced the story's direction and specific details. In the same way that it's fairly obvious Made in Abyss's mangaka has practiced drawing certain stuff a whole lot for a reason. But neither lets that reason overtake the authenticity of their world or the fundamental truth at the heart of their story. I know I'm usually a very specific sort of video essayist, and this is getting a wee bit vague and feely, but we're talking about the border between art and content here. That's the vaguest, feeliest territory there is. Art is something you just know when you see, and when I look at Mushoku Tensei, I feel a lot of things. Not all of them pleasant, some of them deeply uncomfortable. And I know it's got something a lot of other anime don't. Something that goes beyond technical achievements in animation or significance in genre definition. I definitely cannot recommend that everybody watch it, but I've definitely found my own viewing experience to be profoundly worthwhile. Looking at the response online, I think most people who've given it a chance will agree with that, but I know either way you'll let me know in the comments. If you'd like to see a work of art that I can universally recommend, check out my recent video on why we love Horimiya. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.